Remember, if they come in on the phone, they won't show up. If they come in on the phone, they won't. If that one just clicked, that sounds like somebody's joining um, on their phone. I'm and not. <coughs> they go through the. Well, no, you're just fine. Yeah. They have to they go through the application to see it, right? Okay. But if they just come in and they dial in, they're not going to show up on your tenants. Or um, on the list. And do people come in on the phone that's intentionally or. That's what, that's what that one just was. That your heart because it chuck on the I've list. Done, I've done go and meeting where I see that I'm on the web but I call in rather than. And you don't, unfortunately, that's just a. That's right, then we won't go to this. I'll, rem I'll remind them. Um, it's a better attendant when you have food. Well, um. <laughs> Now we've had sort of a steady group, as I said, of 15. The difficulty is they're often not here, which is which is harder for the uh, speakers. Yep. Um, and this goes till 4:15 or 4? 4:15. 4:15. Oh, 4:15 and 4:30. I mean. Well, I have a meeting at 4, so. Okay, so it'll be early. Yeah. Well, it won't be late. It won't go okay. past 4. Oh, I see. It does say 4:30. And yeah. is that the same on the 27? That's an hour. It's gonna be a short. 15 talk. minutes. Probably, I'll send you a schedule for that. Okay, so it's going to be short. Same talk. Okay, well, I'll turn some of the slides though. But well, say, you get the you same can... talk in 45 minutes. I got to. Perhaps, maybe. I, I have to work on the schedule. Yeah, it's not a big deal. You can tell me that day. I just have to know, have a time that comes on. Okay. <laughs> Logistics. It's not easy. So I'm going to remove the. I don't know. Maybe you can leave that attendance thing on it. Probably, if you want people to. Um, did he give you a microphone? Mm -hmm. No. I just have this. Usually, he's put it on you. Are you okay standing mostly? Here? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm okay. fine. Um, generally, if you want people to interrupt while you're talking, if they have questions, tell everybody that. And the people online should just talk and say it because okay. um, you may not notice if they're raising yep. their hand somewhere. Right. That's okay. But if you want them to wait till you're done, say that too. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, so we've got, we've got three so far. I'll give people another couple minutes. Okay. I know because you have to you have to leave at four. Well, no, I'm not going to leave at four. I'm going to leave when I'm done. But I was planning on a one hour talk and then this. That's but fine. on my calendar, yeah, it, it looked like it ended at four. And so uh, I, I, when people when they ask me when can I attend this meeting, I guess around. Amanda said, well, Amanda saw four o'clock is available. Yeah. It's an FOT. You know. yeah, so I told them I'll be 15 minutes late, but I don't okay. want to be after. That's fine. This is kind of it's kind of. That's not what my meeting was doing for saying Oh, yeah, that's for sure. The, uh, I think I'm going to actually announce the first session. Okay. Because I don't know whether that's been subscribed or not. Okay. I'm just waiting for, um, I have his name, but he's here. He's attending all the sessions. And some of the others are new, some of them. Some of the ones that yeah. are online have attended. Yeah, yeah, she's. Yeah. 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 Okay, I wanted to welcome all of you. Again, I think we're going to start because our guest speaker, Dr. Semino, has another meeting that he needs to go to. So we don't want to keep him long. We want to give enough time for everybody to ask questions. I'm assuming all of you can hear me okay online. Just say, somebody say yes. 
Why not? I don't think I'm saying that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, this is the, I think it's the fifth session right now of our seminar series. Um, uh, before Dr. Semino starts to speak, I wanted to tell you a couple of, a couple of other things. If any of you are on the phone rather than on the web, we probably don't have your email address or your name. It looks like uh, Kevin Junk, maybe, if I'm saying your name right, maybe on the phone. We actually do have your email address, but why don't you just shoot me an email anyway and let me know that you attended because I'm not sure what's going to pick up from the go to meeting. Uh, with the names, but we need all your names and email addresses because I send out materials afterwards and also Jessica Wakely sends out a very short evaluation survey. Some of you have attended regular what about two questions? Something like that. So a few questions and how did you hear about it? So it won't take you very long to fill out, but we really do value your your feedback um, and so we need your email for that as well. Um, We've got five people here. We've got three online so far, and, and I expect some other people may usually come in to both places <laughs> somewhat after the, uh, the session begins. Um, as you all know, or if those of you who are new here may not know, these sessions are recorded, and they are available on the CCTS website, um, and their playlist and all the previous sessions are there as well. Um, also, after each session, I send out materials, well, additional reading materials about the topic, so uh, for your enjoyment or not. Um, but I will be sending them out. That's another reason I need your email address for that. Um, some of you may have seen um, flyers or signs about the immersive session we're having on uh, July 27th. Um, we're not sure that, that, for those of you who are remote, we're not sure that that's going to be broadcast or not. Um, um, we're still discussing that. But um, it's really a duplication of what you're seeing here. So um, for those of you who see it, you say, oh, boy, I liked what I saw here and I want to come to that. It's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the same talks. But for people who can't, a number of people can make the hour session now, but couldn't devote a half day. Other people would prefer the half day. So the, that half day session is for those people. So if you see those signs, it's not new and different. It is still the same sessions that we've been having. Um, with that, I will introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. James Semino, who's director of the UAB Informatics Institute, which is a co-sponsor with the CCTS of this series. And his talk is on standardizing the language of healthcare systems, why words matter. Thank you. Um, there's a, there's a, a subtitle there, Biomedical Terminologies and Ontologies, which is uh, a largely what this talk is about. And uh, I've adapted some of that to this topic. Um, so let's see how that goes. And if you have questions online, please just speak up. Otherwise, keep uh, your microphones mute. That'll probably work the best. Um, Raising the hand, the little raising your hand, I probably won't notice because I'm too busy trying to think about what I'm going to say next. Okay, so um, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about biomedical terms, terminologies, and ontologies. And I want to. I th one of the take-home messages here is that there is such a thing as a bad ontology or bad terminology. There's good terminologies, and you can actually tell the difference. Uh, and paying attention to that difference is important. Um, there are some standard terminologies in healthcare, and I'm going to go over some of those. There's not time to go over all of them, but I'll go over some of the big ones. And then I want to end by talking about the reuse of health data, health record data, which is largely in the form of uh, coded uh, structured data. Often, I'm not going to talk about natural language processing, but more about sort of the, uh, you know, the, the motivations for using health record data and some of the caveats, especially uh, related also to the uh, codable, the coded data. Okay, so you think about the domains of discourse. Whenever you're talking about a terminology, you make sure you're talking about the right, you've got things at the right level of granularity. And there's sort of the genetics and molecular biology and the, and the terminology of bioinformatics is there. And then we have cell biology and we kind of move into translational informatics. And then we move up to pathophysiology and uh, we get to clinical research informatics and then patient care, 
with clinical informatics and then beyond to population uh, health and population informatics. So I'm going to be talking mostly about the patient care domain, the healthcare domain, uh, and terminologies that are used there. And in fact, I think that it's true that the, the most of the work on standard terminologies has taken place in that area. Okay, so what are, what are terminologies? Formal standard concepts of the domain of interest. Okay, so we have in our head concepts of things like pneumonia or heart or any you know aspirin or things like that. Uh, and then when we put them in language, we might use different words for those, and we communicate with each other pretty well because we know each other's synonyms and terms of phrase and accents and whatever else. And so we internalize. When you say heart, I think the same, probably pretty much the same thing. Although when you talk to an anatomist, it's actually interesting because there are arguments about the border of the heart. So how much, like, is the aortic valve part of the aorta or is it part of the heart? And they, people argue about that kind of stuff. And so that's a, almost a trivial example, but there are plenty of uh, other examples of what, for instance, constitutes lung disease. Um, we want to capture the things we say, but it's really about the things we're thinking of, the things that we mean, because the computer is going to record that and save it and regurgitate it and maybe even reason with it based on conceptual information, not just about what letters are in the name uh, and how it's alphabetized, but also how it interacts with other concepts in the real, real world. Um, standardization uh, it can help you with improving data consistency and improving shareability. If we have a standard, then I can put something, I can write it down, whether electronically or however, and give it to you, and you will have, understand the same meaning, even though we haven't talked about what it means. We will have a standard way of representing it. Um, it's useful for data aggregation. So when you have, even if people record things in different ways and use different standards, or they use different parts of the same standard, when you want to aggregate them, if you know how they relate to each other, you can pull them together. So for instance, if you want to know all the people that have lung disease, and we have a classification of lung disease, and you say, well, I've got this person with pneumonia, and I say, I've got this person with lung cancer, we can aggregate them uh, when we bring the data together. And then reuse them for multiple purposes, uh, whether it be for patient care, for research, uh, for billing, whatever, what have you. So capturing the things we say. So there's, I'm going to use a lot of terms, and sometimes I use them a little interchangeably. Um, but vocabulary is the words and phrases and the definitions used in a language. So I'm expressing myself now with a vocabulary of English. A term is a word or phrase associated with a specific concept or meaning. Now, that seems like it should be true in vocabulary, um, but sometimes there are multiple you know, there are multiple meanings of a term, there are homonyms and so on. When we, in a terminology, we have terms that are associated with a specific concept or meaning. So it's not just about the name, but also what we're thinking about. Uh, and then a terminology is a finite enumerated set of terms intended to convey information unambiguously, also called a controlled vocabulary. Sometimes a controlled terminology, which is actually kind of redundant. Um, so finite enumerated set, all right? So you don't just have an endless list of things that people make up and add to them like they do in a language and a vocabulary, uh, but actually it's a, it's a well-defined uh, list and it's enumerated. We can count them and give them numbers. Sometimes we do, one through a thousand, whatever those terms are. But the purpose is to convey information unambiguously, not to write poetry, not to paint a picture, but to move information from one place to another and have it used in the received by the receiver in the same way as it was intended by the sender. The concept is the unit of meaning, okay? Conveyed with a name, a description, a code, but it's the concept that's important. And then an ontology is uh, a formal representation of what we know. So this is actually a term for philosophy. It's a, it's the the um, it's the knowledge it's the uh, the knowledge of what we know, if you will. Um, but or the study of what we know, but in uh, biomedicine, ontology has come for a number of reasons to really talk about terminologies that have been enriched with some kind of knowledge. And typically that knowledge is definitional knowledge, so about the meanings of the terms in the terminology themselves. So an ontology could be, well, here's a list of antibiotics and here's the diseases they treat. Well, that's sort of extensional knowledge, right? That's this, this antibiotic treats this disease, at least today, Next week, maybe it won't, because maybe it won't be the drug of choice or the, the organism that it was killing was, you know, changed. And so it doesn't become the drug of choice. It's extensional knowledge, but the intentional or de information that is definitional, what is this antibiotic? Is it, is it an aminoglycoside? Is it a beta-lactam? You know, uh, how much does it, you know, what color is it? Um, what forms does it come in? Those are more on the definitional side. Okay. So good and bad terminologies. Previously, Say, let's say the 20th century, broadly, the, uh, the only problem with the terminology was completeness. Okay, so 
uh, as a terminology, have everything you need to say. If it doesn't just add more to it, and then it's better. So that really was sort of what was thought. And terminologies were often things in pull-down menus. Oh, look, I got to fill in a blank on a form or whatever, pull-down menu or a checkbox on a paper form. <clears throat> and that was the terminology, those things that went in that question. And you wanted to add another one, you added it. Never mind that somewhere else on another form, there was another list of very similar terms, and now they were out of sync because we have, you know, are you uh, this, that, or other? And then over here, we have four choices and other, and now you go to this other mean the same thing, and you don't know. Because... People didn't worry about that too much. They just said the important thing is capturing the data. We'll figure it out later. Well, later they realized they had some problems. So now we look at, um, this can work. So today we use more sophisticated representations of our data because that way we can do more sophisticated things with the data. But this has un uncovered a variety of flaws in the way we handle control terminology, control vocabulary. All right, so I'm going to give you a little thought experiment, and the folks at home will just have to listen silently. Uh, I guess you could chime in if you if, if uh, well, when we get to the discussion. They can see, your slides. They can see the slides, so um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, well, we'll see. I'm, there, this is a little bit of an interactive thing. So you're going to be charged with. Uh, imagine you are charged with creating a form like a census form that's going to collect gender information for research subjects, patients, library users, students, whatever. Imagine a form that's going to collect gender, okay? Now, the, Ameri the U.S. Census form, the 2010 Census form, said, called it sex, and we can argue about sex and gender. That's a terminology issue. But it had two choices, male, female. It'll be really interesting to see what they put on the 2020 form. Will it be male, female, other? Will it be, you know, how, or will they say, do you consider yourself to be more a male or more a female? You know, I don't know. They're, how are they going to word it? But clearly the answer is male or female are going to leave a lot of people going, I'm not sure what to put down because of my own personal orientation. And the census isn't, you know, they don't want to say, well, then tough, we're not going to count you. They want to count everybody. So they're going to hopefully find a way to accommodate people. Let's say you're put in charge of that. All right. You got three years. What happened to my slide? Changing automatically. Good. Um, all right, we're gonna, now we need a finite enumerated set. How many answers are there going to be? One, two, three. What's it going to be? What character strings will we give to those codes? What will we put on the form? And then how do we organize them into some kind of a useful set? And how many codes do we need? Now, what we want to do is we want people who give me an answer to have a code that corresponds to that answer. All right? So if they – it doesn't have to be exactly right, but it has to be something that covers that. All right? And you'll see some examples uh, in a minute. So just off the top of your head, how many – terms you think we should have? I'm not, I'm not grading. Ballpark. So more than two. Let's sit, let's start with that. It's more than two. Four. Four? I hear four. Any more? There's 52 on Facebook for gender. 52 on Facebook, really? <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. i got to go look that up because i got to go look that up because uh, my class, when I taught, uh, I did a whole class on this, we had 86. Uh, and actually, that was a while ago, and maybe that there were others. That was 2014 when there was 52. Okay, I'll have to look. Um, I think I saw, where did I see a terminology that had a lot more in it? But I'm not going to think it was 52, but I, thank you. That, that's what Facebook is an authoritative source. And so, you know, hopefully they have definitions for what they mean by these things. But think about, no, they don't. So, so then it's not a controlled terminology because somebody will put down, you know, queer. I don't know. And now who's going to know what, that, what does that mean? So... But you think about things like, uh, you know, physical and genetic and so on. Well, let, let me show you my terminology. I made a terminology uh, for – this is the simplest control terminology domain you can imagine, gender, right? It's just – it used to be two. Now it's more than two. Maybe it's 52. But think about, you know, diseases. I mean, that's thousands, right? So this is easy. All right, so I've got a hierarchy, and I've got terms that are have codes. So I've got male. And then under male, I've got male, adult, male, child, and boy. And then I've got female, and I've got female, adult. So the numbers are the codes for the disease, the term. And then I've got other, and then I've got unknown. And then the, the string is the name that I'm using for this thing. And then the indentations are for a hierarchy. Implied, sorry, a hierarchy. All right, so what's wrong with this terminology? I mean, the specific thing that's wrong with it. Gaps. Sorry? Gaps. Gaps. So I'm missing terms. What am I missing? Female child. Female child, right. So now the reason some people will go, why do you have a, why do you have adult and child? I go because that's what people will answer. Now I could say if they say I'm a I'm a male child, I'll just use male. But I've chosen to make that a little more complicated without getting too political. Uh, and so yes, so female child, I certainly would want to have that to have symmetry with the male part of the hierarchy. What else? What that age the child is. 
I don't have the definitions there, so that's good. I should I should include the definitions of when do I what what makes a child versus an adult. Okay, what else? There's like four or five other things from here, so I guess you left unknown is a capture all, right? Sorry? Unknown is a catch-all. Unknown, so unknown is a catch-all, and that's an unknown could be a problem because actually, when when you see unknown, when you're in the emergency room and you look at gender and it says unknown, you go, um, does that mean they forgot to write it down, or they looked under the sheet and they couldn't tell? Uh, so what does unknown mean? Or we forgot to, you know, to, you know, we forgot to write it. So unknown actually is ambiguous. It's got other, it's got multiple meanings. So ambiguity is a problem. What else? Anybody at home want to chime in? Unmute. Anne. Male, child, and boy are the same thing. Very good. So I have redundancy. So I have two terms that mean essentially the same thing. Now, if I gave you definitions, maybe there'd be some slight nuance. But yes, exactly, exactly what I was looking for. All right, what else? So I'm in the interest of time, I'll flip all the cards to tell you. So male transvestite is... A male, right? I think um, so. It may be a misclassification. We, we could argue about that. Um, I've got uh, what else is missing? So we didn't have any spelling the champions, but transvestite is misspelled. Okay, so that's a that's a problem. And um, I think that that's mostly it. Other turns out to be a problem too, and we'll we'll talk about that later. All right. So this is a bad terminology. Everybody agree this is a bad. I mean, whatever you and we could. Maybe there's no good one, but this is obviously bad. And we can actually talk about why it's bad and go, okay, do we want to make it better? Well, yeah, let's make boy a synonym for male child. Let's add definitions. Let's fix the spelling. There are things we could do to make this better. I don't know how it becomes perfect, but it certainly can be better than where it is. And the system is changing slides on its own. Okay, so what happens if the terminology is poor? We can't record the data accurately. Then the meanings of the data become unclear. <clears throat> we might infer something from the data that's incorrect. Um, we might wrong, order the wrong test. We might interpret the test wrong because, for instance, normal ranges uh, depend on the gender sometimes. We might give the wrong treatment and we might do the wrong research. We might put the patient in the wrong room if we get the gender wrong. So we might say, which room do these people go in? This male boy goes in a pediatric male room and, you know, whatever it is, we could, we could figure those out. But if we get the data wrong, then we're going to put somebody in the wrong room. Now, some of these are, that's one example. Let me give you some examples of laboratory terminology that presents some challenges. So a sodium test, take some blood, put it in a tube, send it to the lab, and now, was it serum or plasma? A lot of times they don't care, but sometimes it depends on what you're measuring. And if you have somebody that has hyperlipidemia and you measure it in serum, the lipids are all in there. And the, vo the amount of sodium is in the, only in the liquid part, but the total volume includes the fat. And so the total amount of sodium or the concentration of sodium is going to be based on the total volume. In plasma, the fat's removed. All right, so you get a more accurate representation of the, of the water phase of the, of the blood, how much I have sodium ions in there. So in that case, somebody with hyperlipidemia makes a difference. Um, the method that you do that used to do the test can change the normal ranges. And this happened when I was at Columbia all the time. The lab would change the normal ranges because they had changed the method. And then you'd be plotting somebody's thing, and then it would go like this. And you go, uh-oh, what's going on? Well, nothing went on except they changed the way they did the test. Well, these aren't comparable anymore, if you, or you need a conversion uh, formula or something. But you can't just assume, oh, look, everybody's getting all marked out of that. They used the same code for glycosylate hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, which is always lower than total high velocity. And so, oh, look, all our diabetics are getting better. You know, no, that was, it was just an artifact of the way they were doing the normal ranges. Um, blood type. Sometimes blood types get reported as O negative. That's the result. Sometimes it's reported in two separate tests. We tested for ABO and we got an O. We tested for Reese's, uh, the RH factor, we got negative. So it's two answers. And actually, I was looking at NIH and back in the 70s, they actually reported it as the presence or absence of an A antigen, a B antigen, and an RH antigen. So O negative was actually a negative result in three tests. No A, no B, no RH. The, the letter O didn't appear anywhere. Well, except in no, but it was negative. But it, the letter O as a, as a type didn't even appear there. You inferred O because there's no A or no B. So imagine trying to you know, have a computer figure out that these are all the same thing. And then uh, one of my favorites, Staph aureus, methicillin staph resistant, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So we have an organism, Staph aureus, been around, you know, as long as humans have been, probably probably longer. Um, and then we would treat it with oxicillin. 
uh, and it was respond oxacillin. The test, for some reason, they would use methicillin, not oxacillin, and so they would report that the organism was sensitive to oxacillin or methicillin, and then you could use oxacillin. Well, then we got one of these superbugs that became methicillin resistant. So we report Staph aureus, and then we have a methicillin sensitivity test with the result R, resistant. Okay. Well, then they said, boy, this is a big problem. We should actually identify this organism as methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or a particular type of Staph aureus. And now the answer, the result came back MRSA. So it was a different answer. And then they said, in some places, they just do a test. Tell us if there's MRSA, and the answer is positive or negative. So the answer doesn't even have the organism in it that's in the name of the test. So um, that gets pretty confusing. And there's plenty of things like that with the antibodies and antigens and that sort of thing. All right, so a little history about this whole terminology uh, issue. Uh, I presented a paper at, um, at uh, the Hotel Mirador in Montpellier in Switzerland. That's overlooking Lake Geneva. And at the conference, I met this guy, jean Rule Chiray, and he was very impressed with my talk. Uh, at, or he pretended to be, because he needed somebody to write a review paper. He said, oh, you should write this review paper on what people are doing with terminology. And so I said, sure, and I wrote the paper in 1996, and then in 1997 presented it at the next meeting. Uh, that one was held at the, uh, blank on the name of the, the hotel, but it's in Jacksonville, Florida, beautiful. They, they all have these red roofs. It's pretty interesting. So uh, I presented it there, and then it was published the next year in uh, Methods of Information in Medicine, Desiderata for Controlled Medical Vocabularies in the 21st Century. And that had a list of 12 things of, that had been discussed in the literature. I kind of reviewed all the literature at the time, tried to pull it together and make sense out of it, came up with 12 desirable characteristics or desiderata for terminologies. And the desiderata is a cool word, and that made it a really popular paper because people would quote it, pretend they knew what it meant, or that maybe they'd even read it. Uh, and so it got to be, it's actually a pretty widely cited paper. And, and that's the one that I'm sending out. Okay. Uh, and it's old. So it's, you know, it's uh, 20 years old and almost 20 years. It's written more than 20 years ago. And uh, so it's out of date, but there have been updates by me and by others uh, to add to that. So that I'm going to give you a little, very quick overview of some of the 12 desiderata, some of the easier ones. Uh, and the first one is content, which we already talked about, that adding terms doesn't work. Why not? Because, well, you start adding them in and you get this big conglomeration and eventually you start adding things that are already in there, but you don't know it, so you get redundancy. Uh, or you start classifying in one way and then, you know, somebody takes over for you and they classify it a different way. And so now the classification gets messed up uh, and so on. So um, just adding terms didn't work. And so you have to find, make sure that you can provide the breadth and depth that you need in your terminology. And part of that has to do with the structure. So a terminology that says, well, you can have three levels in the terminology. As soon as you do that, you're going to come up with a fourth level. A structure that says, oh, you can have 100 things at any level in the hierarchy. Somebody's going to have 101. And, and so having a structure that limits the size will, will cause trouble. Uh, um, so the answer is to have a formal policy before you even start to say, how are we going to decide what goes in the terminology? How are we going to put it in there? How are we going to audit it? How are we going to maintain it? So formal editor editorial policy methodology. The second is maybe the most important uh, uh, sideratum, which is concept orientation. The idea that it's the meanings, not the names, that are the unit of discourse. Okay, So it's what's in your head, what you're trying to convey that's important. Uh, related to that are a number of features. There's vagueness. So vagueness would mean that you, your term has no meaning. So you want to have at least one meaning per term, but you don't want ambiguity. You want at most one meaning per term, not multiple meanings for the same term. So my example of, um, uh, what was it, the, uh, the other. So, uh, or no, un unknown was an okay. example of that. We'll see some others. Um, Non-redundancy. One term per meaning. So that was the boy and the male child, right? So those all, and once you, if you're concept oriented, this won't happen. You make sure here are my concepts. Okay, and now here are the names of those. And you don't want the, the same concept being represented more than once. Synonyms are fine as long as they're explicit. And as long as you say, here are two things you can say, and they mean the same thing. They map to the same concept. Concept permanence goes along with that. So once you've created a terminology and people are storing data with it, you can't delete the concepts just out of hand. Um, you know, maybe you can throw, if you want to throw away the data, you can do that. But take a terminology that's used for causes of death since 1900. Okay, we don't want to suddenly start throwing away. Probably most of those in 1900 are no longer considered real diseases. And so we can't just throw those concepts away. People died of those, and we need to know what, you know, how, what we thought they died of. Uh, names of diseases change. The, the sources of disease change. And so we can't just delete these concepts. And I can show you an example, non-A, non-B hepatitis. 
Um, you know, it used to be we had serum and what was it, uh, infectious and serum hepatitis, and then we found tests to detect them and they detect the organisms and the antibodies. And so we called it the hepatitis A, hepatitis B. And we thought, great, now we can test for hepatitis, protect the blood supply. But it turned out there were people that had viral hepatitis, clearly transmissible, same pattern, maybe more severe, but they didn't have A and they didn't have B, so they called it non-A, non-B, all right? Well, eventually we got a test for hepatitis C. The problem was we couldn't just change the name of non-A, non-B to C because now, yes, we could find a lot of those people had C, but not all. Some of them had something else. So although non-A, non-B is, an, is a, a retired term, it's not simply replaced by hepatitis C. Um, we can change the name of the terms as long as you don't change the meaning. So you can bring things up to date, fix synonyms or errors, um, make them clearer. And then there's retronyms in the example I use is transvenous pacemaker. It used to be all pacemakers were transvenous. That is a wire went into a vein and went to the heart and paced the heart. Now there are transcutaneous pacemakers. So they said, hey, what do we call these things over here? They're not just pacemakers. They said, oh, there's a transvenous pacemaker and these are transcutaneous. So we can update the name from what we use for something um, uh, to make it more accurate. Okay, retired concepts, just very quickly, we have viral hepatitis, we have hepatitis A, hepatitis B, non-A, non-B hepatitis, and now we want to add hepatitis C to our terminology, and we want to retire non-A, non-B hepatitis. Well, what you could do is just add C as another child and cross off non-A, non-B and say you're done. But that actually doesn't capture the relationship between non-A, non-B and C. So really, it should be like this. Okay, so you add it like this. So now you can say, find me all the people that have non-A, non-B hepatitis in the year 1990, and now in the year, well, probably, well, 1970, that's for sure, uh, and then, nine, no, say, no, I would, no, it would have been 1980, let's say, they would have been non-A, non-B, and then in 1990, it would have included all the people that previously had non-A, non-B, and all the people with hepatitis C. All right, non-semantic identifiers. So the identifiers I used in my example were numbers, one through whatever. Okay, and that's what you want. You want identifiers that don't convey any meaning. You certainly don't want to use the name because if you use the name and then you change the name, now you have a different identifier and you've introduced redundancy. Um, mnemonics are equally difficult because a mnemonic, you'll see, you know, labs love mnemonics. And so they'll say GLUC for glucose. And then later you're like, does that mean glucagon? Or, and then later somebody will go, what's that mnemonic? Oh, it's GLU. I'll just say GLU. And now you've got two things. So the mnemonics are not a dependable way to be, do coding. Uh, you don't want to use a code that'll run out of room. So think about that statement. And when we get to ICD-9, ICD-10, you'll see examples of codes that run out of room and why that's a problem. Uh, and don't use a hierarchical code. Again, hold that thought. We're going to see a good example with uh, ICDs. Um, so the, the, a meaningless, uh, meaningless integer is a, uh, a good thing to choose. Um, it's unambiguous. Um, it is, you know, the numbers are easy to read. Uh, you can add a check digit. So a check digit, if you don't know, is it something where you do, for example, you can take all the um, all of the digits of the of the number, add them all up, perform some kind of math function on them, and then the result is maybe a, another digit, and that becomes the check digit. So your credit card, the last three digits of your credit card are a check digit against the other. So when you type in your credit card, a web page can immediately tell you if there's something wrong with your credit card number because if you type the wrong digit or transpose them because the check digit won't match the calculation. So that's a that's something where people are actually human beings are typing in codes, a check digit is a nice thing to add. And you'll see an example of that in Loink. All right, polyhierarchy. Um, so that has other names, directed I say the graph, partially ordered set or post set, lattice, multiple hierarchy, heterarchy. I call it polyhierarchy, um, but basically the idea is it's something that have more than one parent in a hierarchy. You don't want any cycles. But you can't, so something can't be its own great grandchild, but you can, things can have multiple parents. Um, you need this to understand what the terms mean. Sometimes the placement in the hierarchy helps you understand what they mean. You need it for tree walking because sometimes you, you find a general term, then you're looking for a more specific term, like uh, my example that I, I screwed up a terminology once by adding Tylenol with codeine to the hierarchy and I put it under the Tylenol class and it turned out there was a similar term under the codeine part, but the hierarchy didn't allow multiple classification, and so that's why I couldn't, couldn't find the term, because I was walking down the wrong path. Um, and then inferencing. So you want to say, I want to know if this patient has, you know, a particular infectious disease, we might have a class of disease. Like, don't give, uh, you know, make sure if the person has lung disease, they get a flu shot. Well, 
you want to have everything that's a lung disease be in the lung disease class for that kind of inferencing. And so the example uh, is good pasture syndrome, the one I use. So good pasture syndrome is uh, an autoimmune disease. You get antibodies to the basement membrane of the lung and the kidney. So in a strict hierarchy, you would have something that looks like this, and good pasture syndrome has to be under one or the other, so I pick kidney, but really you want it to be under both. So you can say, does the patient have kidney disease? They have lung disease. Now you gotta be careful not to count them twice. You don't wanna say, how many people have kidney disease? 20. How many people have lung disease? 20. Oh, I got 40 people. No, you got 39, because one of them has good pasture syndrome. All right, so you gotta be careful um, how, to, how you count your, your uh, data. All right, so poly hierarchy, and I'm gonna show you ICD-10, an example from ICD-10, uh, and I'll talk about ICD-10 a little bit later, but this is some part of ICD-10 that deals, this part deals with tuberculosis. And I don't know if you can read that back there, but it's A15 is in bold at the top, says respiratory tuberculosis. And it goes, then there's A17. I don't know what happened to A16, A17.8, A18, A18.0. So, and all together, if you were, I, did, I didn't, didn't include everything here. There are 51 um, tuberculosis terms. Maybe this is, maybe it is everything. 51 plus 10 hierarchical codes that are not actually used for coding. Okay, so 61 tuberculosis terms. The previous version of ICD, ICD-9, had like 272, had all kinds of things. This is actually much better because it talks about where the tuberculosis occurs, not how it was diagnosed, which is the way they did it the old way. But this is very appealing because you look at this and go, hey, if I want to find all the cases of, of tuberculosis, I don't have to list 61 codes. I can just list, I don't even have to list the 10 codes. Oh, this thing is for some reason changing on me. I'm going to go back. There we go. Um, I can just say, find me all the codes that begin with an A1, and I'll get all these terms. Or maybe I, I maybe have to say, all right, A15, 17, 18, 19. Uh, so I ask for those, and then I'll get all the data. It seems very appealing to do that. The problem is, because tuberculosis can be classified in multiple places, it actually is in ICD. And so if you use these codes, you will miss cases that have been coded as sequela of tuberculosis. So somebody with a B90 code has a sequela of tuberculosis. So they have tuberculosis even if it doesn't, even if they don't have that code, or tuberculosis complicating pregnancy. So 098013, and here's a good example of why you don't want to use letters, right? That O looks like a zero, uh, and then, you know, of course, I's and one's. So ICD, for some reason, includes O's and one's in their, in their uh, or O's and I's in their coding system. And then we've got the few, uh, a few uh, extra ones, pneumoconiosis, sort of tuberculosis, congenital tuberculosis, and personal history of tuberculosis. So all those are all tuberculum, tuberculidides, whatever the plural of tuberculosis is. Uh, they would not be f picked up if all you did was say, find me all the A1 through A A15 through A19 because of this multiple classification problem. Um, okay. Formal, oh, so let me go back one more time since we're, I, ICD is my whipping boy for all, all the desiderata. So we look at these codes, oops, sorry, and we see A18.14, okay? And so ICD increased, ICD-10 increased the size by adding letters to the beginning of these things, so that's nice. Um, but they still use this hierarchical coding system, so you can only have 10 things at one level. And when you run out, it just says other tuberculosis of nervous system. So you've got tuberculosis of brain, tuberculosis, menis, tuberculosis meningoencephalitis, tuberculosis neuritis, and then any other tuberculosis of the nervous system is going to be uh, A17.89, the catch-all for those things. And so, um, they, because the code runs out of room. And I, I don't, haven't looked at 10 close enough to see, but ICD-9 did some weird things where they would lump things together. Oh, look, here's some unused codes. Let's put these codes over there. Well, they have nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter. We'll use the, we can stick them there. Uh, or we get a few overflow, we'll put them, you know, someplace else. And so, uh, pretty, pretty annoying. Okay. Formal definitions. I think this may be the last one. So a formal definition is a structured control, not a narrative definition of the meaning of the term. So it's not just a phrase like you see in a dictionary. Uh, and, of course, it helps understanding. That's the purpose of the definition. But it also can help with terminology maintenance because a formal structured uh, definition can help you figure out, for instance, if you're adding a new term with the same definition, the computer can match it up and go, hey, that's redundant. Or maybe it's a child limit or something. And so maintenance, you can help maintenance with that. Uh, and typically, sorry, this thing has decided to change time, do its own timing. <coughs> it, um, we express this in a terminology with relationships to other terms in the terminology or maybe two terms in some other terminology. And that's when it starts to look like an ontology because we have formal representation of the definitions. And I, I already talked about 
definitional versus assertional knowledge. All right, so here's a narrative definition, serum potassium test, and here's a formal definition. So serum potassium test is a test, has specimen, serum specimen, measures substance, potassium ion. Okay, all of those are controlled terms. Um, is a has specimen measure substance are controlled terminology for relationships. And then, of course, serum specimen and potassium ion, those are also controlled terms that may have their own definitions. Um, and so if we were to express this graphically, it would look something like this. And so we have this form on the, the arrows pointing up are is a, that the arrow means is a, or has specimen or measure substance. And so that's the direction you read it in the direction it's pointing. And so that's a graphical definition of uh, serum potassium test. All right, one more to sideratum. The NIDOS are classified. So NIDOS are classified terms are kind of like other terms. If, you know, we ran out of room. So pneumonia A, pneumonia B, pneumonia C, and pneumonia NIDOS are classified. Uh, and the, the sideratum is to reject NIDOS were classified. And so why do we want to reject it? So we use it for codes where we don't have an explicit code for that term, right? We ran out of room or whatever. Um, it can never have a formal definition because the definition is, um, you know, a tuberculosis of the nervous system that's not anything else in the in the terminology. And so it's not, uh, you can't. It's very hard to create a formal definition, even harder to maintain it. Whoops. Uh, terminology changes with uh, the changes with time as they are wont to do will induce semantic drift. That is, the meaning of the non or classified term will change as you change everything else in the terminology because it's, that's what it. Depends on. So let me give you a concrete example. These are data drawn from uh, the NIH uh, data repository, Beatrice. Uh, and I did this back in oh, probably 2012, 2013. But I, I, I drew data from 2007 um, looking at codes for shock, okay, non traumatic shock. So there's cardiogenic shock, septicemic shock, hypovolemic shock. There may be some others, but those are three biggies. And if you want to code them in ICD, you have a code for cardiogenic shock but there's no code for septicemic or hypovolemic shock, which are very different, um, very different uh, things. In fact, hypovolemic is probably closer to cardiogenic uh, than, than uh, septicemic, but yet you use the same code, 7, sorry, 750, uh, 785.59, which is uh, shock without mention of trauma, not elsewhere classified, all right? Now, 2008, they introduce septicemic shock. So now there's a code, 785.52. They call it septic shock. Great. Now we can code septic shock with its own code. But when we go and look at the data, we can see, all right, the 785.5 with shock, that you're not even supposed to use that code for coding cases, but they did. 785.51, cardiogenic, you can see very small number of cases. And then 785.59, wow, we're winning the war on shock not elsewhere classified. No, of course not. What happened is septicemic shock was making up the majority of these, and they were now moved to a different category. So while this went up, this went down, and this is a statistical phenomenon called um, the Will Rogers phenomenon, when you move things from one category to another. This is because Will Rogers once said during the Great Dust Bowl era, when the Okies moved from t to California from uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, from Oklahoma, the IQ of both states increased. All right, so he, he managed to insult the, all the Californians and the Okies at the same time. But think about it, if only the dumb Okies moved, but they were smarter than the average Californian, then the IQ in both states would, in fact, decrease, right? So it's not, but nobody got smarter. It was just a statistical phenomenon. All right, so how do we deal with this? I'm going to take an example from culinary informatics, which if you Google is actually a term, uh, culinary informatics. So modeling the knowledge of cooking food. So let's t let's start with this example. All right, a show of hands just here in the audience. Which of these is not a fruit? Watermelon, raise your hand if you think watermelon is not a fruit. Strawberry, fruit, not a fruit. You think strawberry is not a fruit. Almond, okay, got a bunch of those. Tomato, okay. So um, now, which of these would you not put in a fruit salad? Watermelon, uh, strawberry, almond, allergic to nuts maybe, um, and tomato. Okay, so. In fact, the first three are, the, uh, so watermelon, strawberry, and tomato are fruits. And by definition, an almond is not a fruit, all right? Um, and so they say that, that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, and wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Okay, and you all, for those at home, everybody raised their hand when they would, said they would not put a tomato in a fruit salad. Well, how do we, what if we had a computer program putting together 
you know, like if you go to the restaurants in Birmingham, it looks like they have a computer program that randomly combines ingredients and go, wow, I never had, you know, shrimp with blueberries before. Genius, you know, but maybe it's just a random menu generator that puts the stuff together. All right, well, we'd like to have a few rules about this. All right, so here's some knowledge, here's an ontology that I created that would help me prevent from putting, prevent putting a tomato in a fruit salad. So uh, watermelon is a berry, okay? and has flavor sweet. Did you know watermelon's a berry? Strawberry is an arrow. This is maybe why you said it wasn't a fruit. So an arrow has its seeds on the outside, also sweet. An almond is a uh, seed. It's also kind of sweet. Uh, a tomato is berry, savory. All right, so these are all, oh, and an arrow's a berry, and, a, and a, uh, an arrow's a fruit, and a berry's a fruit. So now we can write a rule that says, fruit salad has fruits and seeds where the flavor is sweet. So we could write that rule, and now my random menu generator would put watermelon, strawberry, and almonds into, and I picked the almond because I needed something diff different. But So we could take that out and say, you know what? I don't want seeds in my fruit salad. Then just delete that from the, from the definition, and you're good. But it won't put the tomato in, right, because it looks at the flavor and says, uh-uh, it doesn't match. All right, that's culinary informatics. In healthcare, we go through the same kind of, of exercise. So sodium test, if we have a formal representation of what the specimen is, then we have information that will help us figure out when we can determine if it's accurate or not in the face of hyperlipidemia. If we change the methods, we have a formal representation of the methods that will help us understand, hey, these things may not be comparable because they have different methods. And I'll show you an example of where, they're, where that's being done. Uh, blood type. So instead of just having the name for what your blood type is, actually say, what are the antigens and are they present or absent? And then we can infer the blood types from the collection of antigens. Okay, and MRSA, again, we have explicit organisms, and then we have explicit antibiotics, explicit results, the way they used to do it, instead of having this fancy new representation, and again, we wouldn't be confused about whether or not we can give the patient oxacillin for their, or a dicloxacillin or whatever we're using these days for um, methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. Okay, terminology. This is just a, a shot from the old Unified Medical Language System. Uh, work at the National Library of Medicine, but all those books are different terminologies, and that's just a very small number uh, of, of what's used, but I like that picture. It makes me, gives me lots of nostalgia. All right, so standard terminologies. I talked about ICD-10 a little bit, and so that's one big one. No, uh, the National Drug Codes uh, from the FDA, the uh, Rx Norm from the National Library of Medicine, LOINC from LOINC. It's a standards organization that just does the LOINC terminology for mostly for laboratory tests, and then SNOMED, the Systematized Nomenclature of Medicine, uh, which comes now from the uh, Internet. Well, no, I guess it's the SNOMED organization. They changed it to just SNOMED, so their SNOMED comes from SNOMED. Um, uh, I'll give you the little history. So ICD, maintained by the World Health Organization, the code determines the place in the hierarchy. They use not otherwise specified terms, which is okay. Those are just sort of generic, like hepatitis, viral hepatitis, without more specification. That's okay. The meaning of that is clear, even if the actual virus isn't explicit. Um, it's the meaning of the term is clear, but it also uses the NEC terms, um, and then it um, they've extended it in the U.S. with the CM, so ICD-9 CM, ICD-10 CM are clinical modifications that extend the size of the terminology. Um, ICD-9 came out uh, in 1975, and the extension came out in 1979, and it grew from 8,000 to 14,000 terms by adding another layer of hierarchy. ICD-10 and ICD-10 PCS now is up to, uh, came out in 2015, although ICD-10 itself came out in 1980. Uh, it was not till 2015 that we adopted ICD-10 CM in this country, um, and ICD-11 is out. Or is, no, ICD-11 is coming out soon, but who knows? I won't hopefully be giving this lecture anymore when ICD-11 CM comes out. Uh, but you can see how it's grown. Um, uh, and actually, so I should say, whenever I give a talk about the desiderata, and there's anybody from the World Health Organization in the room, they always leave before anybody can ask them, why do you not? adhere to the desiderata because in fact ICD-9 and ICD-10 adhere to only one desideratum which is content coverage okay content coverage the very first and the way they do that is at the very end of ICD it says disease not elsewhere classified so they have a code for every disease just by adding that extra wish at the end but otherwise they violate every every desideratum that, that, that's there all, 12, all the other 11 uh, so they and but ICD-11 is different. The guy who's in charge of co the coordinating committee actually pays attention to this stuff, and uh, he and I have influenced each other's thinking a lot about Krushu, uh, 
uh, influenced each other a lot about the um, thinking about these terminologies, and hopefully he's going to do the right thing. Uh, that's what I hear. Okay, national drug codes, uh, the codes that are on, you know, if you every prescription bottle, you'll find a national drug code listed if it's a prescription controlled regulated substance. Unregulated things like non-prescription drugs may also have NDC codes uh, because although, although the FDA created the coding system, it's the labelers, the, the people that produce the products that actually determine the codes and they can do whatever they want. Uh, they have to follow certain rules. They get a four or five digit code. Uh, and they say label or not manufacture because some people are relay, you know, remarketers and so they can, somebody else makes it and then they sell it. So they're called labelers and they get a four or five digit code from the FDA and then they set a three or four digit code for whatever the product is and then they have a two digit code for the package. And so altogether there's, you know, four to five, three to four, two, so that could be anywhere from nine to 11 digits of, um, of codes. Um, codes can be reused because the packager can do, well, the labeler can do whatever they want. And they say, eh, we're not going to sell this anymore. Let's use the code for a new product. That doesn't mean the code, the product isn't sitting on the shelf somewhere. So you have two products sitting on the shelf with the same NDC code that are maybe completely different. Um, and so that, that's a problem. So here's some examples. Um, and, and you'll make these slides available to people so they can go through them on their own. But the example here I picked was um, nitrostat, so nitroglycerin tablet. And the, the FDA actually has a unique identifiers for everything. God bless them. So 3412 is a unique identifier for this particular package of nitroglycerin tablets called nitrostat, 0.3 milligrams in bottles of 100. Um, their database, last time I looked, set it up this way. So there's the four-digit labeler code, and then there's and they put a blank in there. Uh, and there's the five-digit uh, or sorry, four-digit product code, and then down here they have a second record for the package code because all the products with the same ingredients and strength will have the same product code, and then they just modify it with a package code. So 24 is the code they use for a bottle, a bottle of 100. And they can use, and those codes could be, those are non-standard across even within the label. They could say, oh yeah, well when we're talking about nitrostat, 24 means a bottle of 100. When we're talking about you know, uh, nasal spray with, you know, then it's 24 means of 5 cc bottle or something. So it could be anything. So that code would look like this here. The uh, hyphenated code is typically the way it's presented. Um, you know, computer data entry, they like to get rid of, make it simpler so they get rid of the hyphens. Um, the problem is now you don't know where the hyphen goes. Could be, it could have several, two different forms. Then they also like to get rid of these leading zeros because a web entry form, especially, if you get rid of those leading zeros, now it can just tell you, oh, you didn't type in a number, right? It'll just before it even gets to the software, you say, make sure it's a number, make sure it's an integer. Well, there's an integer with the leading zeros, but now you have no idea which of these different things it is, and there actually are examples of things that that reduce to the same uh, the same integer when you remove the hyphens and leading zeros. So that's a problem. So there are other problems with it too. It's you know, it's not maintained by the if the codes can be reused, there's not any, uh, you know, standards across, like standards for the ingredient or standards for the package. So every labeler that makes diazepam, they can have a different code for diazepam. So there's no way to, to get at that information easily. So the National Library of Medicine, uh, together with drug knowledge-based vendors and, and the FDA and the VA, created um, the Rx norm, which started with the notion of a clinical drug, which is something that has a size and a shape. And a, you know, an ingredient, a strength, and a form like diazepam 5 milligram tablet. Okay, so that's a clinical drug. Valium 5 milligram tablet, that's a brand name thing, but they really focused first on clin getting the clinical drugs. And so these different groups work together to produce Rx Norman. So here uh, is an example, diazepam 5 milligram oral capsule, uh, Valium, synonym is Valium, et cetera. So they, this is an actually a product, and it maps to a... Um, a clinical drug, diazepam 5 milligram oral capsule. And until I saw this example, I didn't realize that Valium is actually, or diazepam actually comes under another brand name called Solus, and uh, it uh, also maps to the same thing. And then there's Valium oral capsule, and diazepam oral capsule, and they have all these different relationships. And then they also have the ingredients, and they have the forms. And so all of this, on this is a pretty rich ontology, and this Rx norm is one of the terminologies that is, um, is required for coding data in electronic health records if you're going to adhere to the, um, the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, not Affordable Care Act, but HIPAA, sorry, standards for um, uh, data, health data. LOINC, 
uh, originally was the laboratory objects, identifiers, names, and codes. Now it's the logical identifiers, names, and codes. There we go. Uh, and it is basically a self name of sort of a, uh, a, a code that sort of describes itself through uh, the way it's structured. I'll show you an example. It was originally created for HL7 messages, which are messages for shipping health information around. Um, and so these self-defining names kind of look like this. There's a, the first part is the thing that the test measures, what you and I would call an analyte. They call it a component. And then they add other stuff to it, subspecies and challenge. And I'll show you some examples, but basically what the test measures. Then there's the property uh, that it measures of that analyte, the mass, the concentration, the number, the number per volume, you know, that kind of thing. So it's got different things, uh, different types of properties that are measured. The timing of the specimen, is it a point in time or is it 24 hour urine or something like that? And then the system, what we would call the specimen, they call it the system. And so it could be blood or urine, cerebrospinal fluid, pool water, cafeteria food, you know, those are all specimen systems. And, and you know, you send it to the lab and say, is there any E. coli in this? And so you gotta have things that are not just body parts. They call it system. Uh, scale, the fifth one, scale is the precision, and it's sort of, is it quantitative, is it qualitative, is it ordinal, is it text, uh, and so they're different way. Basically, what does the answer look like? And then there's a sixth one, which is optional, the method. And so uh, uh, if you want to distinguish two laboratory tests based on the method, LOINC gives you a way to do that. So let me show you some examples. These are not the simplest of examples, but I wanted to show some of the complex ones. So there's the identifier, 4764 plus the check digit, if you know mod 11 is that you can go look up mod 11. That's not modulus. It's not modulus 11, but it's called that for some reason. It's a little calculation that if you calculate 4764, uh, it will turn out the number five, and uh, and so that's the check digit. Then we see the analyte or the um, the uh, the component, the glucose, and then there's a challenge added on to that. And then here is the um, the property, substance concentration, so it's something in, you know, number of milliequivalents per deciliter, something like that. It's a point in time, it's serum or plasma, and it's a quantitative test. That's a long, typical one. Here's one, almost the same thing, but mass concentration. So it's a glucose challenge test. Here it's going to be reported milligrams per deciliter. Here it's going to be milliequivalents per liter, something like that. Uh, notice the different, the different code. And then here's coagulation thrombin time induced. It measure, it's it's uh, measuring the time that something takes, point in time is the specimen, and then the specimen is a control specimen, which doesn't come from the patient, but comes from the laboratory, quantitative, and then there's a method, and so on. So, like, like examples. Okay, there's no clock in here, so let me just uh, make sure I'm, yeah, I'm a little loud. Um, all right, now, well, you know, you guys have been a good audience. SNOMED CT. Uh, long history, started off as the systematized nomenclature of diseases and organisms, became the systematized nomenclature of pathology, eventually became the systematized nomenclature of medicine as the College of American Pathologists took it over and expanded it, and they merged with the, with the read codes. Some at RT was a, another version of it, and they merged with the read codes, the read clinical ter terms from England, to become SNOMED CT, and that's what they call it today. Um, it's a semantic network with definitions. There's a US-wide site license, and it's managed by, I think it says IHTSDO, that's old. They've recently changed their name to SNOMED because they used to be the International Health Terminology Standards Development Organization, but they only did one terminology, so they said, you know, why are we doing this? It's just called SNOMED. Um, and so they have, again, a semantic representation. So there's pulmonary to, uh, tularemia, and it's in two classes, and it has uh, sites, it has uh, findings, it has morphology, and it has causative agent, and they put this kind of knowledge in um, in there. And it's actually the kind of knowledge that harkens back to what pathologists would say about this. Um, I, I don't have time to tell the story, but the desiderata actually uh, influenced the, the restructuring of SNOMED from SNOMED RT to SNOMED CT. Um, and uh, they did it um, by having me present it at the last five minutes of a meeting in St. Croix. And so everybody was very anxious to get out of the meeting. and. Uh, and they just said, sure, that sounds good, let's do it. And they, and they, and they did it. Uh, and, and I didn't have anything to do with it, either doing that. I just gave the talk, but uh, it, it really changed the uh, snowman. Um, this is the NCI term browser, National Cancer Institute term browser, and here's the URL for it. If you're interested in these terminologies, you can go there and look them all up and find examples of them, download them, and so on. One last thing I want to talk about that's fairly relevant in the, in the research community, NIH common data elements. Uh, so these are sets of ways 
of classifying or categorizing, uh, capturing data in research studies. Uh, and they can be very simple, they can be very complex. Different institutes have different standards. So if you go to um, the, uh, the Neuro Institute, they will want you to do um, classify, capture certain common data elements on everybody in your study that's funded by them that have anything to do with neurology. And if you're doing Alzheimer's study, then they have a whole special set just for that. And lots of the different institutes have them. And if you go to the common data elements site in NIH, you can see all these things. Um, it's interesting, if you look at gender, uh, this is the Early Detection Research Network. Um, I'm, I don't remember which institute is, is promoting this, but here's how gender is, is noted. Uh, so there's male, female, unknown or refused, and missing. But if you're something else, you know, you're out of luck. There's nothing else there. I guess you refuse to say you're male or female, and they use 88. So I guess that sort of works. But then you go over to FENX, and they have male, female, refused, and don't know. And if you go to uh, the Global Rare Disease Patient Registry, uh, male, female, other, transsexual, and unknown, and then you can go to the NIMPS, Neurologic Stroke Disorder, male, female, unknown, unspecified, not reported. And finally, the I Institute has male, female, unknown. Those are all different ways of representing gender that the national, uh, the national federal government requires you to use. But it depends, you pick the one you want depending on which institute's funding you. Uh, and, and reconciling these is something that uh, I don't know if they'll ever manage to do that. Um, finally, electronic health records. So there's lots of data in electronic health records, but you need to be wary of them. So why do we want to use these? It's, you know, we can capture the data for patient care, um, but then we can reuse it for, for research. Secondary um, use of routine clinical data now is becoming much more common with the advent of electronic health records. They're captured by clinicians and instruments, so they're often high-quality data. You know, if, you, if a physician is recording, you know, the how the heart sounds or how much you know edema there is, hopefully that's a reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable uh, representation as opposed to say something reported by the patient. Um, it's data about the phenome of the patient, you know, what they kind of look like. <clears throat> and becoming universally available, almost free. The data are already being captured, so all you got to do is get them and reuse them. And so, in some ways, it looks like it's free. But Ferengi rule of acquisition: nothing free is ever cheap. Uh, and, and you'll find that's true with EHR data. Um, Postmortem surveillance is an interesting way to use the data because now you can say, you know what, we were using this drug for 10 years. Let's find out what happened to people who've been getting this drug, and you find interesting side effects, for instance, myocardial infarction, or you know, Achilles tendon rupture, things that you didn't expect to see uh, with the drug are in higher uh, frequency in, uh, once it's been out there in the general public. And you can also use it to validate research studies. So for instance, if you did a study that says, I think adding this drug will lower people's blood pressure by 20 millimeters of mercury, then you can go look and see, well, let's see, let's see what happened. Here's people that got the drug. What was their blood pressure before? What was it after? And so does it validate that study? Um, and you can even replicate research studies by going and saying, you know, this drug, will, you know, these two drugs seem to be equivalent when used in a small population. Let's go to a hospital and say, hey, doc, here's two drugs you could use for this. You know, you're trying to treat this guy for something. Um, you could use this drug or this drug. Why don't you let us randomly pick which drug the person gets since there doesn't seem to be a difference. If they agree, the patient gets one drug or the other, and now they get followed prospectively. And the EHR data then becomes the source of data that you follow to see their blood pressure or whatever. But you need to understand the limitations, and that's critical. And there's a paper on this. Uh, Bill Hirsch is the first author, but a number of people, me included, people that have worked with electronic health record data, contributed uh, a set of caveats. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the, well, let me see how to go through all. Uh, health records, so the data can be incorrect. You know, when you have a research assistant who's trained to collect, answer certain questions, maybe they will get exactly what you want, uh, get it the right way. EHRs often don't tell the complete story. Partly because patients go to different places and get their care in different places, and so they may be incomplete. Um, the data may have been transformed or coded. So, for instance, if you go, all these EHRs have, have ICD-9 data or ICD-10 data. Oh, that's great. You know, it's a coded form. It's there. But it's been transformed from the original data by somebody, a, you know, a medical librarian or somebody, a billing, uh, you know, a billing uh, person who has converted it into uh, a different form. And it may have changed the meaning of those data in the process. Um, there's a lot of data that is in text notes that may not be so easily accessible. It may require natural language processing to get at it, and even then, it may be hard to get it, pull it out accurately. Um, and there may be multiple sources of data that in the EHR all look like the truth, but in fact have come from different places. Different, some was brought from another hospital, some was reported by the patient, some was reported by the patient's grandson, you know, and the, you know, the veracity of these data may be 
different. Uh, and then the granularity of the data that you look at in EHR may be different than what you need in research. So for instance, um, you're doing, you know, oh, I want to know how this patient, patients that got this drug, did their pain get better? Well, let's look at the record. You'll say, well, the pain got a little better, the pain got a little worse, the pain got a lot better. Got a little, you know, what's going on here? If I was doing a research study, I'd have 20, I'd have a scale with 20 little smiling and frowny faces on it, right? And I'd say, all right, where's your pain on here? And it'd be much more quantifiable thing. Nobody's going to do that. You know, they don't do that and have time to do that in rounds every morning in the hospital or in the clinic. They go, hey, how's your pain? Oh, it's much better. Great. You know, oh, it's much worse. Okay, we better change the drug. That's all they care about there. But if you're trying to quantify it uh, for research, the EHR may not do what you want. And then you have to remember that the kind, the way that we carry out research protocols is different than the way uh, we carry out clinical care. So for instance, you're starting a drug and you go, hey, what's it doing to the renal function? Well, you might measure it every day in a study, but if you're out in the wild there, they might not measure it except once a year if you're lucky. And so you may not get the kind of data that you need for, for your research. So a set of recommendations, I won't go into these, uh, but we also, there was a companion piece where we talked about how you could, um, if you're taking these data, what can you do with them to, to try to uh, help you interpret how valid they are for your, your studies. Okay, so summary. Sophisticated use of data requires sophisticated terminology. So trying to, you know, we've gotten away from just, you know, male, female, and other, or just male, female. Now we're getting to things that are going to be much more useful for, you know, capturing data that we need for, especially for reuse in healthcare. Um, there's good and bad and ugly terminologies, and ugly terminologies are often good. Mullink's pretty ugly, but, but good. Adheres to good desiderata. ICD-9, ICD-10 look good, but actually pretty bad. Um, the health terminology standards are moving in the direction, in the right direction. So LOINC, SNOMED, RxNorm, these are all adhering to the desiderata, including ones I didn't even talk about. Um, ICD-11, we'll see how that goes. Um, the reuse of EHR data is improved with the better terminologies. That is, now that we're recording data with better terminologies, we can make better use of EHR data, but there's still a lot of caveats that and for details, you can go read that, that paper. We'll give examples of each of those 12 or so uh, things. So with that, let me see if there are questions. Or I, I, I meant to stop after the desiderata and forgot. I carried away. So questions about desiderata, about the standard terminologies, about what an ontology is, anything. Folks at home could chime in too or sign off. No questions? Do you yep. think it's even possible to get the terminology perfect with, like, how healthcare is? Oh, that's easy. No. <laughs> so the so no, but you know we we're getting better. I mean, the fact that um, that the terminologies are you know people are paying attention to it and looking at things like well you know what it makes a difference if it's serum or plasma. The fact that that's being captured now and paid attention to is a good sign. The fact that when a terminology changes, the uh, things that are deleted. Uh, there are notes that tell you why it was deleted or what it was replaced by and there are corrections. So actually the maintenance process has gotten a lot better. So, you know, we're moving in a better direction. I think our bigger problem now is not the terminology so much as the, the, the workflow uh, of, and the provenance of how the data get captured. So you, know, you have somebody who's rushing through an admission note, you know, and they're, you know, maybe they're not going to be as accurate as uh, even if they have a good controlled terminology or they're creating a problem list, they might only pick the main problems they're interested in and not take the time to code. Ah, those other ones are in my note, you know, and not be as explicit as that. So I think we're getting to the point where now the problem is more how the data are being captured, not just what terminologies are being used for them. Other questions? So okay. how, how yeah. can we get this information to your companies like Starter who are on the front end putting those terminologies. Oh, that they, they do that. They they do that for you. You just have to tell them what terminology you want, and that's where the problem lies. So Cerner says, "Yep, you can use any terminology you want." Okay, well, what should we use for a problem list? You can use any terminology you want, and then you go, "Well, can we use SNOMED? You can use SNOMED if you want." And you go, "Okay," and you go and put SNOMED in, and it's awful. It's huge. It's you know, it's over 100,000 terms, and you go, "How do I even figure out which things are?" I should use. They go, well, if you put it in there, that's what you want. That will support it. So then you have to solve that terminology problem before you go to them. But once you go to them and say, we want to use LOINC, they go, fine, give us the data and we'll put it in LOINC. We'll put in whatever you want. Uh, they work Here we work with uh, intelligent medical objects, IMO, and I understand they work with other vendors to help you 
set up your terminology for storage in the EHR. But the EHRs aren't so much the problem. They're really creating places for control terminology. They leave it up to you, though, to figure out what that terminology is and how to maintain it. Uh, which, you know, is right. I mean, you, you know, they don't run your lab. So your lab goes, hey, we came up with a new test. So we're going to come up with a new code and a new name. And you got to then tell that EHR what that is so it knows what to do with it. I think I've heard pushback with terminology as it relates to meaningful use. Okay. So meaningful exactly. use. Yeah. So so meeting the meaningful use requirements, there's you have to use uh, the terminologies I mentioned. ICD is one. Um, and then... Uh, um, SNOMED, ArcSNOR, SNOMED for problemless, although you could use ICD. I don't think they say you have to use SNOMED. You could use ICD, but it's a horrible terminology for problemless. Uh, and then MOINC and ArcSNOR, so MOINC for labs and ArcSNOR for medications. There, there's probably not pushback about those specific terminologies as much as there's pushback about having to use a terminology and just, or versus just making a free text. But the fact is that the decision support things and the billing and all these other things depend on control terminology. So Pushback is mostly futile because it's, you know, the physicians going to the administrators, we don't want to use this, and they go, too bad. And, and so, but there's no pushback from the administrators because they, they need that to make the systems work. Okay? okay. Good. Other questions? Samino J at UAB. Um, I'm happy to answer email questions as well. And we really appreciate it. You will have to explain to your next meeting that you're a little more late than you thought you would be. Good job. Maybe they don't notice but, I'm not there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all online. Uh, again, if we don't, if you signed in with your email, that's great. If we don't have it, please um, send it to me. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Next time, um, our session is going to be on, uh, Jake Chen is going to be talking, and he's going to be talking on unlocking data secrets, the importance of structure and organization. So, thank you all. Brian had a change. Had a, this doesn't look the same as it's looked before, and I can't figure it out how to stop the recording. Looking for the place to stop the recording, and I can't see it. Which one? Well, yes, I could end the, the meeting, but it doesn't say stop recording. Just end the meeting for now. Yeah, I'm just afraid. Well, don't end it then. Because yeah, I don't want it to, to end without. Normally. And there's a different kind of menu that I'm used to where there's a little red button and it'll say stop the recording. Mm -hmm. But I do not see that. And I can't tell if this see. expands. And if it does, I can't figure it. Show, Show all, all controls. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay, okay. never mind.